This is Words Aptly Spoken, which comes from Proverbs 25:11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. The written word is a precious treasure. We want to preserve written knowledge for God's glory and as an anchor to the history of the church and its classical conversations. We hope to encourage the reading of words and of the word. So, welcome to Words Aptly Spoken, where Jennifer Courtney and I dis discuss a book each week from the Classical Conversations curated curriculum with you. This is a book club for lovers of the word made flesh. It's Thursday, June 15th, 2023, and I'm Lee Bortons. This month, we will discuss books from a variety of stories in the Classical Conversations. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the book called Analogies for All of Us by Classical Conversations Multimedia. And next week, we will discuss words aptly spoken, Socratic dialogues, also from Classical Conversations Multimedia. And for those of you that are interested following this show Thursday nights at 7, we have another show at 8 p.m. Uh, called Unfragmented, where Kevin Novak and I are the co-hosts. We discuss a book a month rather than a book a week, so we can go more in depth. And uh, we're eager to have all of you join, as well as uh, keep in mind that in the in August, we'll be bringing back the Math Map Book Club, where you can ask us questions about math, me and Kirsty Gilpins. Okay, so let's begin the book discussion. We have our new producer here tonight, Christine Berry. So excited. Uh, Julie Melendez will still be popping on now and then. But um, we're just grateful for Christine coming on and uh, taking just taking charge of so many different things. So these podcasts are run well. So I guess we're playing some word games tonight, Jennifer. But before we play our word games, do you have some things to share with us? I do. And I actually want to I'm going to throw a, a little wrench in things because I want to back up even beyond, um, before my first question. And we have this beautiful cover in front of us. So I thought we might want to spend a minute talking about why there's a bridge on the cover of Analogies for All of Us. So yeah. what? Yep. So if you if somebody wants to bother reading the in, introduction, I know a lot of us skip those and go right to the problems, but there's actually a, a couple paragraphs where it says a community of bridge builders, and uh, you're going to see a lot of bridges in the uh, entire book. And so it was appropriate, we thought, to have a famous bridge across the front of the picture to remind the students that uh, this is what they're going to be doing. They're just connecting ideas, just like two sides of a bridge or two pieces of landmass are connected by a bridge. Yeah, and hopefully they'll have a lot of fun doing it, which is one reason we wanted to spend some of our time tonight playing games, because there are lots of different ways to connect ideas. Um, one of one game that um, we won't play tonight, but I do want to tell you about it in case you want to play it later. It's a favorite of mine and Lee's is that you start with a book title and the next person names the book title. Um, that is somehow connected to that one. You don't have to explain yourself, but you may be challenged to explain yourself if the connection is not obvious. Um, and we, we're just nerdy enough to really be able to play that game a really long time with book titles. We like that one. So it's fun to do connections. So yeah. good. So tell us um, what is an analogy and maybe give us an example. Do you have one in mind? Well, you know, that all by itself is interesting because, uh, you know, with the five common topics, there's definition and comparison or where we start off with things. So you're actually asking me to define analogy. And analogy is a comparison of two possibly unconnected ideas where now you connect them. Um, and it's the comparison of those words that makes the analogy. So you got the two common topics. So in order to explain what analogy is, you need to use an analogy. So it's kind of circular. <laughs> And it's reasoning. So it might be something along the line that's very simple, like um, uh, what's an analogy to um, glove to hand? Well, someone then may say, well, sock to foot. So it's go, and that's actually in a very similar category. But I find that people aren't particularly good at analogies when it crosses subjects. So maybe over the course of the evening, we can come across a few. But for instance, um, can I have a minute to explain one? Sure. Okay. So yeah. classical education strikes people as really difficult sometimes because we've been trained to think like a modern, but what we don't notice is that naturally we all think like a classicalist. And mm -hmm. so an example would be to say to somebody, well, if you're interested in knowing how to study something well from a classical perspective, tell me how you would study, say, Psalm 23. 
-hmm. right? It's really difficult to make the analogy of how I study Psalm 23 to things that we've been trained in as being academic subjects. And so somehow it's different. So for example, in Psalm 23, I know let's only assign it to fourth graders and let's only do it in the fall quarter, right? <laughs> we would never think to do that. But for some reason, that's what we want to know. You know, what, what year do I teach this to my child and how do I get finished with it as soon as possible? Versus the Bible, we study all our lives. We never say we're finished. And we always are excited to see what the next thing is when we repeat looking at the, uh, the scriptures. And so I think people become uh, better educated when they recognize that the things that they love to study for a lifetime the way they study that and the things that make it so they study it well or take those things and make them analogous to the studies of subjects that maybe you don't like so much or aren't so familiar with. Yeah, that's good. And that and that's a good point, Lee, that we talk in the book because the book is largely for younger students to have a beginning in this idea of making connections. We've really focused over and over again on making proportional analogies. Um, so having two terms on each side and making the connection very, very clear. But honestly, analogy is a much bigger idea as you described. So we we would look at an epic simile in Homer. That's an analogy. Homer is making a connection between a warrior and a bee, for example, that goes on for many lines because he's a lot older than our you know, we might be when we start off making proportional analogies so he can make his connection um, a little bit longer and more complete. Um, but yeah, we have all kinds of analogies. So that was good. Good discussion. So you, why do you think they took the analogies out of the SATs? But those of us on here tonight, we all probably took the analogy portion of the SAT. And now it's, our children didn't. I mean, if I'm being snarky, I want to say they took it out because it was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> they took out the fun thing, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I always, I've, it, they say it was to make room for the essay because they thought that was more important. Mm -hmm. But you know, how hard is it to um, to be objective while you're uh, grading an essay versus uh, just a answer that's true or false, you yeah. know, fill in the blank. So the other thing, reason I think they took it out is people were that. that analogies are the hallmark of a thinking person. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's what they wanted to measure was thinking. Mm -hmm. They were measuring creativity. Yeah. Boy, are we creative now? We don't even know what sex we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My kid, this, this happened in our house the other day because <laughs> we were, we were talking about just some mm, modern errors in parenting where um, there's a movement to affirm everything that children think and do. And my daughter, just, just about the time we were discussing that my daughter's volunteering at our vacation Bible school and um, a little boy got frustrated with his artwork and they were drawing on glass. And so he smashed the glass in his frustration, which is what sometimes you do when you're small. And um, so I just was able to use that as an analogy for my kids. I was like, we would never affirm that behavior. You can't break the glass when you're frustrated about your drawing. We have to take you aside and correct you. So I said, what did the leader do in the craft room? And she said, well, she took him aside and she corrected him. And then he had to help her clean up the glass. And then they started again. I was like, right, that's, so that's we were, true. yeah, that's a practical analogy we had in our house this week. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys, yeah. Michelle, uh, Lynn, have any analogies you can think of? Feel free to chime in anytime. I'm just intrigued by the warrior and the bee. What a great, fun analogy that would be. I don't so, remember reading it, but anyways, I just loved it when you said it. I don't know why this is, Lynn. I would have to remember. It may just have been that I was thinking a lot about stylistic devices, but I have one copy of the Iliad where I took an orange highlighter and marked all of the epic similes, and it was it's a really favorite copy of mine because now I can see what kinds of connections Homer was making. Um, and also I aspire to write an epic simile as good as one of his someday, <laughs> because he's quite good at, at extending them for a long time and connecting lots of things about eagles to warriors or bees to warriors, but they're always these wonderful um, analogies from nature um, 
to people where he's letting you have a lot of insight into their character. So someday I want to write one of those. So I'm going to keep this copy where I have highlighted all the epic similes <laughs> and maybe I'll be able to do Ooh. it someday. I do have an analogy I want to share. I visited a practicum yesterday. I almost forgot mm. about this. And think of it as an analogy, but she asked to be quiet during the table talk. She's been in CC for two years. She's going to be a tutor this year. And she goes, I don't want to share because I don't know. And I just want to listen. And we're like, fine, you listen. And the third and last table talk of the afternoon, all of a sudden she got so animated and she goes, wait, I think I get it. She said, you all in the classroom are just like Jesus. You ask questions and then you do parables. You use the visible things so they can understand invisible things. And I'm like, wow, yes. So she did an analogy all on her own, which I thought was beautiful. Yes. That is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So, so Jennifer, I want to be analogous to what you just said. So, you, you know, we'll meet folks who say, um, uh, you know, I, I'll never be as good a writer as Jennifer Courtney. Mm -hmm. And I guess we could say, that's right. If you're not willing to just skim through a book and find similes, right? So if the, mm -hmm. we, there's even analogies between the things we do and the things that we want to do. And there's always examples of how to get to where we want to be. Um, but sometimes we're not willing to do the work. So sometimes we may know things, we may know the right analogy, but we may not be willing to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I'm sitting here thinking is that I don't mm -hmm. let myself think about things in analogies. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So no, I explain it. <laughs> <laughs> Give me an example. I need an analogy. Uh, it, I I don't I can't give you an example. I'm just sitting here thinking that I don't when I'm listening to things or I'm reading things, I don't know. I just don't feel like I am making a comparison. Maybe I do, but my brain is so fried now at my age that mm -hmm. I just don't remember them. So um well, you just made an analogy when you use the word fried. Right. <laughs> Go deeper. <laughs> Expand. Yeah. Yeah. So well, that's one of the reasons in the analogies book that we have included some practice with idioms because all idioms, just like saying my brain is fried, are analogies. You're connecting your idea of your brain being tired or not functioning the way you want it to, to, you know, frying an egg or something. Yeah. Or it, so that but that's what I'm, I'm that, I guess that's making my point is that I don't think about what it is that I am saying or doing in those terms if that, yeah, if that makes, okay, again, so I'm going to ask you if you, that makes sense. So you're saying you do it, but you don't know that's what you're doing. Right. A grammar, yes. fit, a grammar. Now that mm -hmm. you have the grammar, I bet you'll notice that you're doing it. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, and it's interesting because I, I've been through Challenge A with my kids. I even tutored it with my kids, mm -hmm. but it was, you know, that first time you're in challenge and um, never having sat in the class and then you're responsible for tutoring them. Um, it was like just so many things that I was trying to grasp that um, I wasn't making connections Um for what it was that we were doing. And thankfully I get to do it again this upcoming year. So just us talking about this now is gonna make it more concrete for me. So um, that's analogous to my example about the Psalms. You're gonna right. look at the same thing all over again a few years later and in a different way. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. And there's also that's things true. you're doing unconsciously just like using idioms that you'll now you'll think about consciously because we've said this tonight, now every time you use an idiom for a while, you're going to be super conscious of what connection you're making, of things that you haven't thought about because they were just in the air you breathe. Um, and we talked also last week or the week before on um, about just literature being a, an analogy for life. So you've, I mean, I watch you thinking analogously all the time when we're discussing mm -hmm. books together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of that unconscious like. Mm -hmm. 
you know, Mm -hmm. like we were doing this and then it was like, and then it was like, and you don't even realize you're doing like every three Mm -hmm. words or that, you know, that, 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 you know, um, Mm -hmm. you're just not conscientious of it or I wasn't conscientious of it. Yeah. So do we need to be conscientious? And if we are conscientious, what does that afford us? So I guess I would argue that sometimes we do. Let me give an example that I gave for years at practicum speaking. Um, First, I should say I'm a strange person. I really like tutoring challenge three, but also teaching three-year-old Sunday school, (laughs) but the years in between are a little difficult for me. So anyway, I, if I tutor, if I'm teaching at Sunday school for three-year-olds, and I'm teaching them to sing worship songs. I am so happy when they sing, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. But if you're our age and you're a mature believer, your your better analogy is to say, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing because you've been tried and you know that you need fortresses and bulwarks in your life. And you can probably name some times when you have relied on that knowledge. So. Sometimes I would argue that we need to be conscious of it because as we grow and deepen, we need better analogies to explain what we just experienced. Kind of like what Lynn said with the practicum participant. She needed to make that connection in order to share with everyone around her the joy of her discovery. And so she needed to make certain connections and be able to say them in words. Mm -hmm. And I would also add to that, that she needed to be in silence Mm -hmm. to get to that point. Yes. Not participating was Mm -hmm. allowing her to observe and come to those conclusions just based on everything that she had been witnessing. And I think um, just to answer Lee's question, I think we need analogies because analogies help help us to find truth. Mm -hmm in all that we do. And I'm going to mute myself. I have to change rooms because apparently this room was reserved. So oh, okay. we'll see you'll we'll see me this. walking and stuff. No, I'm going to turn my video off too. I've seen some chatter. Was that you, Tim? Were you chattering? Do you want to unmute and share what you were thinking? Just, just me chattering away out here. <laughs> <laughs> you can share it out loud. Um, actually, that, that example reminds me of... Um, how ratio and proportion can be, can be thought of this way, right? The ratio has this defined relationship between one quantity and another, but proportion gives layers to that. So um, the this, this simple one-to-one kind of ratio relationship is good for, for children to see, right? Mm-hmm. To say, this is like that, and just mm-hmm. that uh, apples and oranges are like one another in some ways and different in other ways. But but then you can add those layers in a ratio to say, this is like this in this way. And these over here mm. bear the same relationship, even though they're very different from the things over here. Um, so, so fables, like Aesop's fables are great for kids. They're, they're simple. They have a, a very pointed message. Um, they're, they're uncomplicated by gray or nuance Mm -hmm. and they're helpful for an adult, but really as adults, we love the layers and the complexities and seeing all those things that help us to see in literature, the sorts of things that we deal with in real life. And, And it makes it all the more relatable, even though it's still an analogy for life. Yeah. That's good. It's funny how we used to know this too. You know, if you picked up school readers, the first form reader would have a lot of fables and stories like the little red hen in it mm-hmm. <laughs> because, because they knew this is where you begin. You make those black and white connections and you give stories that can be layered later. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Good. Well, we got a little bit off topic. That's okay, though, because we talked about some good analogies. Before we get to all of your questions, I have one one for you, Jennifer, and you can deal with it how you want to. One thing I would like to make sure that we do this evening Mm -hmm. is um, there's some unusual words and that are pronounced. Maybe you know they're difficult to pronounce as well as possibly define. 
So I wanted to make sure that we spent some time on the grammar of the analogies, okay. as well as to play your games. So do you want to do that now or later? Yeah, well, we can do the your plan. No, go ahead. We'll do the grammar now. You well, if you go to page nine in Roman numeral nine, so that's I X. Mm -hmm. There is the list of words. And so I know the one that's like, that's spelled L-I-T-O-T-E-S. <laughs> How do you say that? I think it's litotes. Is that right? Does anyone know? I think that's right. Litotes. It's a Greek word. Most of the stylistic devices are Greek words. So um, in the guide for pronunciation, it makes it look like it's litotes. Well, I've heard you say litotes and I've heard other people say litotes. Maybe it's yeah. tomato, tomato. Yeah, it, it probably is. Um, and then what about this other one where we felt the need to put uh, in parentheses pleonasm? <laughs> yeah. Is that pleonasm. the right mm -hmm. Pleonasm. Yep. Pleonasm. Mm -hmm. All right. And then further down is another one that's synecdoche. Mm -hmm. no. Synecdoche. Synecdoche. Mm -hmm. Synecdoche. Yeah, as people get further away from using dictionaries to say things and pronounce them and pronounce things, sometimes uh, some of our listeners may not even know how to use those. So I wanted to make sure you pointed that out. Yeah, and that that page is there because as we were uh, working on analogies, we realized mm -hmm. that once you get that form of the proportional analogy, uh, you know. Uh, baby is to bottle as uh, you guys help me finish it father um, is the steak okay there you go <laughs> so that um that once students mastered that they were really close in many cases to um using stylistic devices that they would need in rhetoric as part of their persuasion or their beautiful expression of thought and so all of these rhetorical devices per in every lesson are built off of the whatever the basic analogy was so for the um for the analogy by um synonym then that leads you to make similes because if you have words that mean the same thing you're you're leading toward making those kinds of connections um so and, and the also, figures of speech are on the next page over right. page uh, xi 11 right there's an example of them and I will say that the one you asked us about first, if we want to just go with litotes, litotes, whatever we're going to go with, um, that one of the masters of this is actually St. Paul. So um, he's the master of understatement by negation. So you now you can, Michelle can be conscious of it and look for that all over Paul's letters. You can look at the definition when you get back home and have your... Um, your analogies book in front of you, and then you can go all through Paul's letters and look for all of those. So, I actually have Quizlet up with the terms analogies nice. for all of us. <laughs> nice. So. <laughs> Very so good. To Cambridge, it is litotes. Lytotes. 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 Okay. Lytotes. All right. Lytotes. We'll go with that for tonight. I've been practicing some pronunciations this week. So. <laughs> so then I have a question with that page nine, where we have the figure of speech annotation chart, where we learn, where we show the students uh, just similar ways to mark things, because there could be a lot of figures of speech in a single sentence. Mm -hmm. Would you say that if your ch child left high school, left challenge B, became 20, however you want to you know, refer to it, and they knew these uh, dozen terms on the left, that it would help them in their uh, writing? Absolutely. And Absolutely. And just um, kind of like um, Tim's analogy for, for um, ratios and proportions, a similar thing is here. So if you look at the first one, it's alliteration, and that's relatively easy to do. Um, you add lots of words in a sentence or a line of poetry that start with the same letter or sound. Um, and you can have something like Dr. Seuss's ABC where you have barber baby bubbles and a bumblebee, <laughs> which I can still remember after reading to my kids because it's alliterative and it has a meter to it. Mm -hmm. But you can also have something as complex as Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And if you um, particularly use the Tolkien translation, he is a master of that um, alliteration, which helped the poets remember and recite their lines. Mm -hmm. So you can span the gamut from Dr. Seuss to, you know, um, 
high middle ages romance. Yeah, and so the way you use these in speeches, like in Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream, mm -hmm. and knowing that you say things like three times, but four mm -hmm. times is too many. And how could that possibly be true? Well, there's something about the human ear and threeness and things mm -hmm. like that. That so even so this analogy book leads us to those kind of um revelations. But like you said earlier, right now we're just looking at how to use this do these dozen words and what are the bridges that help us understand them. And that's all the parent needs to know. Uh, should come out of this year if they do more than that or this that, that's out of this book I should say if they do more than that uh, the student learns more wonderful yeah but that uh, kind of mathematical formula to how words work which most adults don't even make that connection that words are very mathematical otherwise they wouldn't be pleasing to our ears yeah and and because um this is a beginning study there should be careful assessment if this if a child follows the instructions and and does what you have said but maybe it's not as pleasing as you thought it could be or as sophisticated as you thought it could be that's a, a lesson that can wait for another day they followed the instructions they made an analogy they understood the connection they were making that's what you want to accomplish and they can keep practicing and refining so and then for those that go through the CC curriculum, you may notice that in the IEW, there's a short list of mm -hmm. tasks that are stylistic that the students carry through that may or may not relate to these analogies. But I know that one time I was trying to correct my David's paper when he was like in challenge two. And um, I'm, I thought that he was missing a pronoun. And he looked at me and said, no, mom, that's an invisible who which. <laughs> right but because he had a fun way of remembering it he remembered it so this mm -hmm. is where mnemonics help us with the uh, uh with grammatical ideas and yeah. they're gonna be all through this book too yeah so with that i'm done hijacking you let's do what you <laughs> wanted to do <laughs> okay well let's since we looked at that page let's start with the first one with alliteration so um here are the rules to the game we are going to use um analogies um, and we are going to use the proportional form that I mentioned. So I'll give you an example in a second. We're going to start round one by using only nouns. And also, I'm going to give you a letter. So first, let me give you an example. If I said um, C, you could say cart is to camel as cow is to cabinet. So those terms are only related as far as I know. I would have to dig deeper. But as far as I know, they're only related by beginning with that K sound. Cart is to camel as cow is to cabinet. So I'm going to give you guys a letter and you're going to make your analogy, your alliterative analogy. So let's use the letter B and stick with nouns. So who wants to go first? I need paper. How about bat is to boy as bobble is to balloon? Okay, nice. Good job. How about box is to basement as boy is to billboard? All right, nice. Who's next? Sorry, I'm a little slow on the uptake. It's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just realized that like the Dr. Tim, Seuss. Like oh, Tim, you got one? Sure. Okay, go. Uh, bug is to bilge water as bottle is to Beetlejuice. Nice. All right. So this all reminds me immediately of how effective car school is. Mm -hmm. This is an easy game to play when everyone's antsy to get somewhere. Yep. Okay, wait. You got yours, Michelle? <laughs> No, because now I'm okay. confused. I thought we were doing. I know you said it was the beginning B, the letter B, it. but it's just B's to B's. It doesn't yep. have to do with no the, other relationship. Uh, okay. So Brown. I think a noun. I think it was nouns. Oh yeah, we did yeah. say nouns, but okay. So give me a second. Brown. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Is to 
Okay, brown is the bottle as um, uh, um, broken is to baby. No, not broken. That's not a noun. Um, brown. Hmm? Well, if brown and broken are their last names, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I, broken I love is that. <laughs> I always Thank hope you. that this will happen in community too, because everyone will chime in and fix it together. So I also have seen students, if if they might say brown cow and broken window to help you out, right? They might transition it into a noun and an adjective, which would totally be fine too, because there's just warming up and thinking. So, so that's a great tip, Jennifer, that just because uh, maybe the students run around the room real quickly, playing uh, around the world, everyone taking a turn, um, it doesn't mean it's an isolated event, even in that community. It's okay to help each other. Yep. Absolutely. In fact, it, it's better in community if you do. So um, the other way you can play if you're not doing car school is if you have the games categories, they have a lovely um, alpha a die that has all of the letters of the alphabet on it. And you can play chance and just roll. We use our category letter die for many, many things. You can come up with geography terms. If you're in challenge A, we use that all the time to play word games. So. Okay, that was a good warm up. We're ready. Okay, now, you're ready. Okay, so I'm going to challenge you a little bit more. Let's use the letter P and do it with verbs. I'm going to start. Pull is to pack as place is to, like, you know, you place something as to put. Okay. And I like that, that you used a word that is um, an equivocal term. So place does function as a noun and a verb in English. And I guarantee you in a room full of 12 year olds, someone is going to call you on that one, Lee, and then you guys can discuss the different meanings of the word. And so I, I love that. All right. Who's next? Verbs that start with P. Push up is to panic as pass is to picnic. Oh, good. We have another equivocal term because picnic can be a noun too. Nice. We have a right. pass, like a mountain pass. All right. Yep. Fun. Okay. All right. Poke it. Poke is to prod as park is to punch. Woo! Nice. Go, mm -hmm. Michelle. Mm -hmm. I and like all... that one too because we think of poke and prod as a group sometimes, you know. And a prod could be a noun and a part can be a noun. Yep. I've got one. Okay. Pickle is to pinch as parse is to plug. Nice. <laughs> and pickle once again, both, right? Yep. Now a kid might say, a, a modern child might say, what do you mean pickle? Like you can pickle vegetables. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and plug too, they could talk about, so. That's why the challenges are fun. All right, now we're really warmed up. So let's, the, we, we talked about threeness. So let's do it a third time. Let's use adjectives and let's use the letter F. It changed the game. So, all right, F and adjectives. Three, fast, four, fun. Free, fast, for fun. Good. I used fun too. I had fluffy, fun, feathery, fickle. <laughs> Mine all had one syllable. Oh, yeah. What did you so have? Um, I had a mix uh, up one to three. So that's a good variation. You could specify syllables too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to teach a child what a syllable is, easy game. Mm, yep. Learning is just so natural as you go about conversing about things, as long as you pay attention to the word you use. All right, I've got one. All right. Farcical is to fudgy as flanged is to fast. Okay. Tim is trying to think of all the hard words. I love it. All right. Who okay. else? How about Did you have one limb? is to fabulous frantic is to fabulous as fuzzy is to feisty nice so do you remember in the cartoon book tintin there was the two detectives 
and they would introduce themselves. Um, and you had the joke was you had to be able to read because they spelt their last names differently. So Thompson and Thompson spelt differently. And one of them would say, I'm Thompson with a P like in Philadelphia. And the other way to say, I'm Thompson without a P like in Venezuela. <laughs> I love it. Oh. Okay, it took me a while. Funny, okay. fatty, fickle, frosty. Nice. All right. Okay. We have to um, pause and take our commercial break because time is getting away. Oh, from I got to read so it. Okay. You, you got Yes. Okay. So I'd like to thank our sponsor, classicalconversationbooks.com, where the books discussed can be purchased. We have the entire 2023 Words Aptly Spoken Book Club's calendar at leeborton's.com with links to the CC book site. So visit and plan to join many of our book clubs. Next week's book club, so if you need to go purchase it, it's for Thursday, June 22nd. It will be discussing Words Aptly Spoken, Socratic Dialogues. And I'm super excited about that book because I have read um, Mino. I've not read the other dialogue in there. Uh, that book was put together as part of our curriculum after my children had gone through challenge. So this will be my first pass through the whole book. So join me next week. Nice. All right. All right. So are we ready? This one is a good warm up for poetry. I'm not going to give you a letter this time. You pick your starting word and you make a rhyming analogy. Um, and I wanted to put this one on the slide just in case we all needed to see the way the sort of shorthand for making proportional analogies. So this is a shorter way of saying bake is to cake as make is to rake so that you don't have to write out all the words. That's how we're training the kids in analogies to write their analogies. So, all right, rhyming so single, words. So the yeah. single call, colon means is to, mm -hmm. bake is to cake as is mm -hmm. double colon. Mm -hmm. Bake is to rake, okay. Yeah. Good. Right, what are we right. doing? Just matching So just up? rhyming words. You start with a rhyming word and go. Well, now I need Dr. Seuss. I know. Okay, go ahead and say yours, Tim. Park is to mark as shark is to park. Okay, right, nice. Fast is to last as past is to mast. Tap is to map as tap is to wrap. <laughs> Stop is to pop as hop is to lop. <laughs> There you go. Now you really are on Dr. Seuss. You are writing hop on pop. I can hear it. <laughs> Did anyone else have one you wanted to share? I don't know. Let me try it. Onion okay. is to bunion as funion is to, oh, I was going to say dungeon. Dunion. <laughs> you could say grunion. Grunion. Okay. Grunion hunting. There you go. I don't know what it, what's a grunion? They're little um, crabs. Oh, very hunt. cool. Okay. You can hunt when you're at the beach. Look, here's our science lesson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So I you guys may have used some of these words, but um cat is to hat as mat is to that. Nice. Very good. All right. See, we're warmed up now. We're getting faster. So this would be a fun one to do as a lightning round around the room. And um it's not too far off of what we would do later if we were writing poetry saying challenge three and we needed some rhyming words you can just spend some time brainstorming some rhyming words and um, that's one of the reasons why forms help you mm. um it's actually easier to write poetry that has a sometimes that has a strict form than it is to write free verse because mm -hmm. um, you have some limits that you have to operate within okay all right so let's try now um antonyms so opposites so i think i have one on the slide which is hot is to cold as fast is to slow right. oh so up is to down as black is to white oh good now you've written that book um go dog go isn't that what it, <laughs> the red dog is in the blue dog is out <laughs> The green dog is up. Okay. <laughs> Too many children's books in my head. <laughs> All right. All right. So who else has one? Lazy is to crazy as hazy is to clear. All right. Nice. 
Matt is. To, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Michelle. Okay, Matt is to glad as light is to dark. Nice. Got a rhyme in there too. You and Lynn both did. Yeah, dry is to wet as awake is to asleep. Nice. Yeah, you know what? It's almost easier if you do try to rhyme them. Your brain just goes naturally to similar words. I even noticed with like your hot, cold, fast, slow, that they all had that middle O. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I got a little um, creative on mine. So I did soft is to loud as piano is to forte. Oh, I was looking at my piano. I'm a, I'm a big fan of looking around the room when you need inspiration. So mm -hmm. good. All right, so um, let's do the, the, since those were antonyms, not to be too clever, but let's do the opposite and do synonyms now. So um, two sets of words that mean the same thing. Oh, sorry, we're not doing that one yet, Christine. Sorry, I threw in an extra round. What are you doing? So we're doing... Um, synonyms instead of antonyms. I didn't have an example on the slides. So. Oh, okay. All right. So synonyms. Mm -hmm. Hot is to warm as frozen is to cool. Okay. Yep. That works. I did pretty is to lovely as nice is to kind. Do you have one, Tim? Fast is to speedy as cold is to frigid. <laughs> Very good. All right. Lynn, do you have one? Uh, sa sassy is to pert as messy is to sloth. <laughs> I like that. All right. Michelle, you were waving your hand. Does that mean you're still working or that you have it? I was trying to think of... Uh, like a, a British, I've got toilet is to loo. <laughs> nice. And I'm trying to think of. Um, Truck is to lorry. Yes, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, or, Lee. <laughs> or sure. trunk is to boot, right? Yeah. That's fun. Yes. That was a really fun one. I like that idea of doing um, different um, languages like that. That was a really yeah. good idea. Yeah, you could do. Let's do one that's French. Okay. I don't know if they can. <laughs> um, bonjour is to goodbye as bonsoir is to good night. So noir is to black as there you black go. is to white. There you go. So that would be really fun. So we should try it. They could do it in Latin. That would be a great way to integrate. I was just thinking the same thing. All right, we're going to rewrite the book and do all the analogies in Latin and in math and all the mother curriculum. <laughs> <I'm> joking. <laughs> uh, soldier is to militate as imperator is to emperor. I don't know. Yes. I think I did it backwards on my proportion. Yeah. But we followed. So, yeah. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, you know, military terms had to get in there if we were going to talk about Latin. <laughs> okay. Um, another thing to note about doing the synonyms is that this is similar to what we're asking them to do in IEW when they're asked to substitute a quality adjective for a more common one or a strong verb for a, for a weaker one. We're just asking mm -hmm. them to do that exact same game and think of words that mean the same thing, but might make their writing a little stronger or more unique. Good. So that would be an interesting podcast all by itself would be to run through the IEW styles, uh, stylistic, um, what word am I missing there? Devices. Compared to our yeah, compared to our analogies to yeah. show folks that, uh, you know, because we we still, no matter how much we love classical education, we tend to still edit and pay attention to what's right in front of us. And we don't always remember to bring in that analogous other things that you've done. And so um, that would be a good exercise to look through how are we doing analogies throughout the ambicidarians uh, uh, through challenge four. Yep. Because we right. are, you can't speak without using them. You can't, yeah. This is, we're just trying to pay attention to them just as we described um, with Michelle. So, okay, let's do a genus species. So um, now you can put that one up. All right, so have genus and then species. You can also reverse these, but fish is to tuna as beef. Oh, I didn't do very well there. 
as beef is to steak. And I got to yeah. edit it. You read it out loud and then it's not as good as you thought it was. Okay. So we've corrected mine now. Fish is to tuna as beef is to steak, maybe. Okay. Because your fish is bigger than tuna and your beef is bigger than steak. So yeah. People know what you're doing. Right. And my kids do love making food analogies. So when I got to genus species, I think that's an easy entry way um, to genus and species. So, all right. So like drinks is to tea, the way dessert is to cake. Sure. Yep. Or flower is to daisy, like mm -hmm. cloud is to nimbus. Aww. Yes. Excellent. Spirit is to angel as human is to child. Ooh, that would be a really great um, challenge three philosophy discussion right there. Yeah. Was that true or not? What he just said, mm -hmm. right? They could really have fun exploring that one. Um, I was thinking too, as we were talking, this is, this is another good one for a science lesson um, because you could have, um, you know, a cat, let's say, and then you could fill in the blank with everything from tiger to a domestic house cat and the kids. So then you can play and make a group analogy so that everyone's is different. So you can give them the genus and, and have them name the species. You don't have to have them come up with the whole thing. So you could give them two animal genuses and let them fill in the species. And, and if you did that and gave them a couple of minutes to think, everyone would come up with likely a different species. Um, so. So Jennifer, we're out of time. You want to give us some Oh my gosh, words? we are. I can't believe that. Okay. Yes. We'll so have fun. to, let's go to our closing quote and we'll have to circle back and come to math analogies another time. Okay. But um, I think we talked about this at the beginning, but it's a good place to close. As a bridge connects two different sides of a river or chasm, analogies connect ideas to one another and our thinking. But that's not all. Analogies are like bridges connecting our previous experiences with our current ones, so our past and present. Since analogies relate ideas and memories to each other, we use analogical thinking in our daily decision making. And furthermore, since we don't live alone, they create bridges between our ideas, memories, and experiences, and the ideas, memories, and experiences of those around us. So the student of analogy is learning the art of relationship much greater than the correct answer found in a solutions manual. So our end, our goal here is not the correct answer, but to discover ways to relate to our world, our neighbors, and to our God through language. Thank you. So, all right. Did you okay, say you know, at the beginning, Jennifer, that um, the analogies are basically the art of relationship? I can't remember if we said it at the beginning. I no. thought maybe I missed it, but that's brilliant. I, mm -hmm. I really like that. I didn't, I didn't think about that, but that is, yeah, that is exactly what I think we've been doing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Welcome. Oh, all right. So I think Christine did put a note. We are not doing Socratic dialogues next week, Lee, because we all had a schedule conflict. Oh, that's right. That was the week we're scheduled. Okay. So, so join us next week or two weeks from now, June weeks. 29th. And the soul of science, uh, one of my longtime favorites. And if you want to know why classical conversations is the way that it is, this is one of the foundational books to developing the curriculum. So see you on June 29th. All right. Thanks guys. It was fun.